Nine Mile, Jamaica, February 6, 1945. Robert Nesta Marley is born on his grandma's farm. His father, Norval Marley, was a construction engineer who had been in the military. He was 60 when he married 18-year-old Sedella Malcolm, Robert Marley's mother. Sedella was the descendant of slaves. Not long after Robert was born, Norval and Sedella separated. Norval was not in Robert's life much when he was a child, except that one time he basically kidnapped him to live near him in Kingston with some random elderly woman. A family friend found Robert and returned him to be with his mom in Nine Mile. Norval died of a heart attack when Robert was 10 years old. By that time, Sedella ran a small grocery store to make ends meet. As a child, Robert was shy, yet gained a reputation as a, wait for it, psychic. As someone who read palms, gave advice to adults, and yes, predicted their futures. I'm not joking. He also grew to love soccer and would play the sport for the rest of his life. When Robert was 11, he met a friend at school named Neville Livingston. Robert called him Bunny. Bunny called him Bob. Bunny's dad and Bob's mom fell in love, and ultimately this led to Bob and Sadella moving to Kingston to live with Toddy and Bunny. Sadella and Toddy had a daughter together, Claudette, who became both Bob and Bunny's younger sister. The family lived in a slum area of Kingston known as Trenchtown. They were so poor that Bob slept underneath a small house on the ground. Around this time, Bob and Bunny started singing together. Bob's mom was a singer, and Bob found that he really loved singing too. They also both really got into R&B and ska music from American radio stations that reached the island. A legendary dude named Joe Higgs started giving Bob and Bunny music lessons for free, teaching them them how to harmonize. Bob also began learning how to play the guitar from another legendary dude named Vincent Ford. By age 15, Bob realized that he needed to make some money to support his family. He dropped out of school and became a welder. One time, a shard of metal got stuck in his eye and he had to go to the emergency room to get it removed. After this, Bob was like, screw welding, and decided he wanted to pursue music as a career. Meanwhile, another young guitarist named Winston McIntosh started taking music lessons with Joe Higgs, and that's how he met Bob and Bunny. In 1962, the three decided to start a band. Winston changed his name to Peter Tosh. At first, they called themselves the Teenagers, and then the Wailing Rude Boys, then the Wailing Wailers. However, by the time Bob was 18, they were known as simply the Wailers. Also by that time, Bob and his friends had gotten pretty good at writing songs and had even recorded a few of them. There was one in particular that stood out, Simmer Down, an anthem for those living in the slums of Kingston. The song got the attention of producer Coxon Dodd, who recorded it at his studio and released it on his label. Simmer Down was a big hit, selling around 80,000 copies and turning the Whalers into local celebrities. The Whalers recorded some new ska and rocksteady stuff with various Kingston-based musicians. Coxon and Dodd produced it as well, and he released a lot of it as an LP called The Wailing Wailers in 1965. Also around this time, Bob fell in love with a singer named Rita Anderson. Rita was in a group with her cousins called the Solettes. The two got married on February 10th, 1966. Bob was 21, Rita was 20. Just like that, Bob was the adopted father of Rita's 15-month-old daughter, Sharon. Despite gaining fame through his music, Bob Bob and his band had yet to make money from it. Shortly after he married Rita, Bob decided to go to the United States to try to make some more money. He ended up in Delaware. Wait, Delaware? Yes, Delaware. Bob temporarily left Rita to find work in Delaware where his mom had been living. You see, by then, Sedella had married an American named Edward Booker and had two children with him, Richard and Anthony, both Bob's half-brothers. They had lived in Wilmington, Delaware since 1963, and Bob decided to move next door to them. There he worked various jobs, from being a forklift operator at a Chrysler factory to being a lab assistant at DuPont. 
also apparently made money as a parking attendant, dishwasher, and even worked overnights in a warehouse. However, Bob hated it in Delaware. He especially missed Rita. Less than a year later, he was back in Jamaica. Shortly after his return, he began to grow his trademark dreadlocks. He started to get into Rastafarianism, a religious movement that had emerged in the 1930s, primarily among Jamaicans struggling with poverty. Even though he'd once more travel back to Delaware to earn some money, by now Bob had decided to go all in with his music. He started a record label called Whale and Solemn with Bunny and Peter that released music by both the Whalers and the Solettes. Ha! Get it? The Wailers continued to release singles that were locally successful, including the hits Bend Down Low and Mellow Mood. However, they continued to struggle financially. Heck, the entire country was struggling. This was a time in Jamaica in which many couldn't find steady employment and poverty was widespread. At the same time, influenced by the aforementioned Rastafanarianism, there was also this dramatic counterculture movement and music was a big part of it. Drugs and political protests also were. In June 1967, Bunny was arrested for the possession of cannabis and ultimately served 14 months in prison. Rita took his place in the Whalers during that time. In March 1968, Peter got arrested for protesting apartheid in South Africa. Still, 1968 was a pivotal year for Bob and the Whalers. Around the time they shut down their Whale and Solemn label, they met the American singer Johnny Nash. After collaborating with him, Nash's manager, Danny Sims, agreed to help the band out. Over the next four years, the Whalers would record some of the most influential music in history in both Kingston and London. These new songs were not rock steady nor ska, but a new genre, kind of a slowed down ska mixed with traditional Jamaican folk music. That new genre was called reggae, and today Bob Marley and reggae are basically synonyms. In 19 in 1970, Bob founded Tough Gong Records, a reference to his nickname, Gong, and the fact that it was tough to make it in the music business, eh? Around that time, the Whalers had teamed up with the legendary producer, songwriter, and singer, Lee Scratch Perry. The Whalers wrote new stuff and recorded with Perry's band, The Upsetters. The first batch of songs that resulted from this ended up being featured on the Whalers' second studio album, Soul Rebels, released by the British label Trojan Records in December 1970. It was their first music to be released outside of Jamaica. That was followed by their third studio album, Soul Revolution Part 2, released by Perry's record label Upsetter in 1971. But the Whalers made basically no money from Soul Rebels nor Soul Revolution Part 2, and so they ditched Perry after that. Meanwhile, they had found another legendary producer to work with named Leslie Kong. They recorded some amazing stuff at Dynamic Sound Studios in Kingston back the previous year that Kong really wanted to release as an album. Bunny didn't want him to, though, supposedly threatening Kong with a curse if he did release it. Well, Kong released it anyway. That album was the fourth studio album by the Wailers, simply called The Best of the Wailers, even though it was not a compilation album. You could say Bunny's curse worked because Kong died of a heart attack a week after its release. Bob was getting frustrated by how difficult it was to support his family being a musician. By this time, Rita and Bob had four kids together, the aforementioned Sharon and Sadella, David, aka Ziggy, and Steven. Bob decided he needed to follow the aforementioned Johnny Nash to Europe to try to reach an audience with a disposable income. In 1972, Bob, Bunny, and Peter moved to London after signing with Columbia Records. They continued to scrape by, first living in a one-room apartment without a kitchen. They toured England, getting three pounds a week to open for the aforementioned Johnny Nash. Well, the crowds were much more into the Whalers than they were into Johnny Nash. However, after the tour was over, the band still didn't have enough money to even go back to Jamaica. Fortunately, they got a meeting with Chris Blackwell, a record producer who had founded Island 
Island Records, hoping they could work out a deal so that they could travel back to Jamaica. As it turns out, Blackwell grew up in Jamaica and had already licensed much of the Whalers' music. Not only that, he offered the band 8,000 pounds to record an album that Island Records would release. It would mark the first time a reggae band had access to a fancy studio, the same type of studio pop stars got to use. It would be a classic. On April 13th, 1973, Island released the Whalers' fifth studio album, Catch a Fire. Although it didn't do that well commercially, critics adored it. And today, it is considered not only one of the greatest reggae albums of all time, but one of the greatest albums of all time. The most recognized song off Catch a Fire, though, was Stir It Up. The Whalers toured both the United Kingdom and the United States. They opened for Slot and the family stone. However, they were fired for, wait for it, being more popular than the band they were opening for. They even now were on TV. Meanwhile, Blackwell gave his home in Kingston to Marley. It would serve not only as Marley's office and where he recorded, but also his home. The Whalers returned to various studios to record what would become their sixth studio album, Burnin, released by Island on October 19th, 1973. Critics also adored Burnin, featuring two big radio hits Get Up Stand Up and I Shot the Sheriff. The album was also a commercial success. The singer and guitarist Eric Clapton was so impressed with the Wailers that he released a cover of I Shot the Sheriff which did even better commercially. The Wailers were finally getting worldwide success when tragedy struck. Around the time of Burnin's release, Peter got in a horrible car accident that killed his girlfriend and nearly killed killed him. Meanwhile, Bunny and Peter were upset that Blackwell was seemingly giving all his attention to Bob and not them, despite them also contributing significantly to the Whalers' music. Not only that, but Blackwell charged them for their tour. You heard that right. He didn't pay the band to tour. He charged them. Both of them left the band in 1974. Even though he was sad to see his friends go, Bob stayed with Island Records. He assembled a brand new back band that included Rita, his wife, on background vocals. Now, by this time, Bob and Rita had actually drifted apart. Even though they were still married, and they stayed married for the rest of Bob's life, they had begun seeing other people. Bob ultimately fathered at least 12 children, seven from relationships outside of their marriage. Bob's new band quickly recorded some new stuff. Now advertised as Bob Marley and the Wailers, Island released Bob's seventh album, Natty Dread on October 25th, 1974, featuring the now classic song No Woman, No Cry. Natty Dread was another commercial and critical success, especially in the United Kingdom, where it peaked at number 43 on the UK albums chart. But the No Woman, No Cry version you're likely more familiar with is their live version. That version was a major radio hit appearing on their live album, Live, which Island released on December 5th, 1975. It captured a couple concerts the band performed at the Lyceum Theatre in London the previous summer. Bob and the band also created quite a buzz in the United States by playing shows there the previous summer. Speaking of American success, Bob and his band finally got that with the release of his eighth studio album, Rasta Man Vibration. Island released it on April 30th, 1976. Six. Featuring the radio hit Roots Rock Reggae, it was the only Bob Marley studio album to reach the top 10 on the Billboard 200 chart, peaking at number 8. Rasta Man Vibration also featured the notable song War. Its lyrics are almost entirely taken from a speech by the Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie, a dude who heavily influenced both Bob and Rita. Even though Bob generally distrusted politicians, 
musicians, he agreed to play Smile Jamaica, a free concert at National Heroes Park in Kingston, organized by the Jamaican Prime Minister Michael Manley on December 5th, 1976. However, two days before the show, seven or eight of Manley's political opponents broke in to the Marley home and shot Bob, Rita, and their manager, Don Taylor. Miraculously, all three survived. Rita survived a shot to the head, while Taylor survived a serious shot to his leg. A bullet skidded Bob's chest and went into his arm. If he'd been inhaling instead of exhaling, he might have been dead. It came that close to killing him. But he was fine enough to indeed play the show two days later with Rita at his side in front of 80,000 people. After this, though, Bob was pretty shaken up and understandably decided to leave Jamaica. He wouldn't come back for two years. He spent some time in the Bahamas first before settling in England with his new girlfriend, another singer named Cindy Breakspear, who ultimately was the mother of Bob's son Damien. While there, he finished recording his ninth studio album, the appropriately titled Exodus, released by Island on June 3rd, 1977. Exodus was an instant classic. Another commercial and critical hit, another album considered one of the greatest albums of all time. In fact, in 1999, Time Magazine called Exodus the best album of the entire century. It spent 50 six consecutive weeks on the UK albums chart. In addition to the title track, Exodus featured the hits Waiting in Vain, Jamming, Three Little Birds, and One Love, People Get Ready. After Exodus, Bob Marley had become a superstar. Despite being a superstar, he wasn't above the law, but it probably eh, helped reduce his punishments. On March 10th, 1977, local authorities arrested Bob for possession of cannabis. He didn't have to spend 14 months in prison like his old friend Bunny. He was just fined 50 pounds. It was during that time that Bob and his band were wrapping up recording new stuff. But before releasing it, Bob and the Wailers went on a huge tour across Europe. Before they could even finish that tour, however, Bob discovered after a soccer injury that he had stage 3 melanoma, an advanced form of skin cancer. The cancerous spot was on his toe, but he refused to have his toe amputated, which likely would have saved his life. Instead, he sought alternative treatments for the rest of the year. Island released Bob's 10th studio album, Kaya, on March 23rd, 1978. While it was another commercial hit, critics were more mixed about it. Kaya featured the hit song, Is This Love, which peaked at number nine on the UK chart. Despite going through cancer, Bob continued to play shows to promote Kaya. On April 22nd, 1978, Bob made a dramatic return to Jamaica with the One Love Peace concert at the National Stadium in Kingston. Promoted by the media as the, quote, Third World Woodstock, it showcased 16 of the world's most popular reggae acts and attracted at least 32,000 fans. At the end of the eight-hour show, in a somewhat awkward moment, Bob pressured two political rivals onto the stage to reluctantly shake hands hands, the aforementioned Michael Manley and Edward Siaga. He then urged Jamaicans to unite. This symbolic gesture later got him a Medal of Peace from the United Nations. Bob Marley and the Whalers then went on a big tour across North America and Europe. From June 25th through the 27th, 1978, the band played a series of concerts at the Pavilion de Paris in uh, Paris, France. Recordings from that show ended up on their second live album, Babylon by Bus, released by Island on November 10th, 1978. Probably more than most live albums, Babylon by Bus did a great job capturing the passion of Bob's fans. In December 1978, Bob finally visited Africa, visiting both Ethiopia and Kenya. During this trip, Bob was inspired to write some songs that would make it on his next album. One of those songs was Zimbabwe, a song of 
support for the rebels there trying to overthrow their apartheid government. Well, that song became the rebels rallying cry. He would later perform it in the country after they got their independence to a crowd of 60,000 people with more than 90,000 more outside the venue trying to get in. Bob would visit Africa three times in total. In April 1979, Bob and the Whalers performed in Japan, Australia, and New Zealand for the first and only time. Then they played a bunch of shows in North America before Island released Bob's 11th studio album, Survival, on October 2nd, 1979. Survival was arguably Bob's most overtly political album yet. It was controversial, even being censored in South Africa. In addition to the aforementioned Zimbabwe, Survival featured the hits So Much Trouble in the World and One Drop. It also featured the song Africa Unite, a song which promoted Bob's pan-Africanist views. In early 1980, Bob and the band recorded some new stuff back home in Kingston. This new material made up what ultimately would be Bob's 12th album, Uprising, released by Island on June 10th, 1980. Uprising was Bob's most overtly religious album yet, with nearly every song on it referencing Rastafarianism. It was also one of his most successful albums. The only other studio album that sold more copies was Exodus. Uprising did especially well in the United States, peaking at number 45 on the Billboard 200 chart. It featured the hits Could You Be Loved, Forever Loving Ja, and Redemption Song. Bob Marley and the Wailers went on their biggest tour yet to promote Uprising. They broke attendance records all across Across Europe. Of note, in Milan, Italy, they performed to around 110,000 people. It was the biggest audience of their career. In the United States, they played two consecutive sold-out shows at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Fans at these shows likely didn't realize it at the time, but Bob's health was severely declining. Around the time of the Madison Square Garden shows, he suddenly collapsed while jogging in Central Park. After being rushed to the hospital, he learned that his cancer treatments weren't working. The cancer had spread to his brain, lungs, and liver. Bob performed his final show with the Whalers on September 23rd, 1980 at the Stanley Theater in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The Whalers canceled the rest of the tour as Bob sought additional treatment in Germany, but by the time he arrived in Florida to be near his mother, his condition had worsened. Bob Marley died on May 11th, 1981. He was just 36 years old. It seemed like not only the entire country of Jamaica, but the entire world was shocked and devastated by the news of his death. An estimated 100,000 people showed up to his funeral, which Jamaica's government officially conducted. Hundreds of thousands of others lined up to catch a glimpse of his casket. At the funeral, the now Jamaican Prime Minister Edward Siaga said about Bob, quote, He was an experience which left left an indelible imprint with each encounter. Such a man cannot be erased from the mind. He is part of the collective consciousness of the nation. Most of Bob Marley's commercial success came after he died. On May 23rd, 1983, Highland released his 13th and final studio album, Confrontation. It was a collection of unreleased songs Bob recorded in his final years, and it featured one of his biggest hits ever, Buffalo Soldier. In the years since his death, many compilation albums have come out. The most notable, however, is Legend, a greatest hits collection that is the second longest charting album album of all time and best-selling reggae album of all time. It spent 2,165 weeks on the Billboard charts and has sold more than 25 million copies worldwide. Today, Bob Marley's legacy is inescapable. First of all, most of his descendants are talented and successful musicians themselves. His Tough Gong recording studio is still thriving and hundreds of thousands visit the various Bob Marley pilgrimage sites sites throughout Jamaica each year. Heck, Marley is a big reason why tourism continues to be an important industry there. Rita Marley, she's still alive and has especially continued to preserve Bob's legacy. The Whalers also continued after Bob's death in various forms. Bob Marley is who most people automatically think of when they think of the entire genre of reggae music. But Marley is not only the best-selling reggae artist of all time, 
time. He's one of the best-selling artists of all time. In 1994, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In 2001, he was awarded the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. Bob wasn't like most pop musicians. He was spiritual. He was reflective. He was extremely generous. According to the historian Roger Steffens, he regularly donated money to at least 6,000 people every month. He never owned a house, yet bought many houses for other people. Bob's music is unique in that it is political, yet unifying. He used his music as a tool for social activism and as a global ambassador for both Jamaica and all African nations. Yet his music became just as popular with the rest of the world. Today, you're just as likely to hear his music played at an American college fraternity party as you are at a party in Kenya. More than anything, his music is just uplifting. It just makes you feel good. And while Marley is easily one of the most influential musicians in history, his influence extends far beyond his music. He remains a symbol of Jamaican and African pride, social justice, and spiritual consciousness. And he continues to inspire new generations of fans around the world. Few things made me happier, man, than listening to the music of Bob Marley and the Wailers. Oh, and I should also mention that there's a film that just recently came out about him called Bob Marley, One Love, in case you didn't know. It seems to be uh, doing pretty well. Anyway, so what's your favorite Bob Marley song? Which artist should I cover next for this series? Let me know down below. Thank you for watching and listening.